Good morning, folks. My name is not Dr. Octavio Martinez, Jr. He is, uh, unfortunately, he's sick and unable to be here today. My name is Linda Frost. I'm the Director of Planning and Programs at the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. And Hogg, along with CPPP, is just thrilled to welcome you here today. Uh, we're going to spend the morning looking at forensic peer support, um, which is something that, that uh, I think is new but a real frontier for Texas. I think it has a lot of potential for where we are now and where we're going. Um, the Hawk Foundation has been looking at peer support in general for a while. We've been collaborating with the Department of State Health Services uh, to fund Via Hope, which is a training and technical assistance center in Texas that is doing certification of peer support specialists around the state. At this point, over 450 certified peer support specialists are in Texas, with over 600 who've actually had the training. Um, this summer, the Center for Public Policy Priorities issued a brilliant report. The link is uh, in the materials for this, this session this morning, um, with Megan Randall and Catherine Ligon doing the, the heavy lifting on that, outlining forensic peer support, the use of peer support for people who are incarcerated or who are moving from jails and prisons into the community. And when we saw this, we thought, now is the time. Texas has an infrastructure uh, for doing quality, uh, impactful peer support, and we know uh, that there is a strong need for reducing the number of people with uh, mental illnesses in jails and prisons and providing community supports uh, for people getting out of jails and prisons, and this seems like an important assist in that process. So Catherine and I got to talking, and we thought, let's have a discussion. Let's bring in some of the best experts we know who know different pieces of this issue, because we felt like there isn't really anybody who knows everything about uh, forensic peer support. But we know, we've got good Rolodex. We know people who know pieces of it, and we wanted to get everybody in the same room and uh, get that information out and have a discussion. So that's the idea of this morning. Um, a few housekeeping things. Uh, Y'all have noticed that there is some, some lovely food and coffee in the back, courtesy of CPPP, so help yourselves. The restrooms are on either side of the elevators. Um, I think you've all been warned about the parking, but if you do not have a UT parking permit and do not have a parking pass on your car at this moment, walk right to our front desk and get one because uh, UT is vigilant. Um, uh. <laughs> we're also, this is a bit of an experiment for the Hogg Foundation. We are live streaming, so thank you to our live stream audience. Um, this is the first time we've live streamed an event, but we feel like it has a lot of potential. Uh, we're hoping we don't have glitches, so, so uh, you'll have to bear with us if we have some technical problems, but we have our expert assistant, Cameron, who is helping this process go well. Thank you, Cameron. Um, and we will also have um, the, the live stream in uh, time-stamped version available on our YouTube site afterwards. So for people who weren't able to be here or if people want to go back to some of the information, uh, it will be available there. The microphone for it is on this camera. So if you are in the back, if you have a question or if you're participating in the discussion segments, speak up because we want to capture what you're saying on this as well. And also, as a, as a, in order to improve the quality of the live stream, we're going to be asking speakers to summarize any questions um, so that we're sure to capture that on the live stream. Um, I think with that, um, we're ready to, to get started. So thank you all for being here, and, and please join in and participate and help make this morning a productive examination of the issue of, of forensic peer support as we move forward in Texas. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Tuesday Marler. Uh, Tuesday is uh, a remarkable peer support specialist in Texas. She has been a coordinator for the East Texas Coalition for Mental Health Recovery. She has been a catalyst for change everywhere she goes. Um, she is incredibly skilled at bringing together different pieces of experience and, and technical expertise to help people 
in all walks of life move forward on a path toward recovery. When we wanted to start the session today with a concrete look of some of the challenges and opportunities for people with mental illness transitioning from jails into the community, we couldn't think of anybody better than Tuesday to, to give us a sense from her own experience of what are some of the challenges and opportunities in intersecting with the criminal justice system and moving into the community to move forward uh, in a positive path to recovery. So Tuesday, thank you so much for being here. Hi, um, my name is Tuesday Marler, and I'm gonna go ahead and start, uh, I'm a certified career specialist, also an advanced level rap facilitator, and I've worked at Austin State Hospital in Spindle Top, and now I work uh, at ACE Texas Behavioral Health Network, coordinating um, just trainings and advance and supporting other fellow peers in the recovery process and the journey into life. Um, so what I'm going to share with you, I could share so much and that being a peer specialist totally rocks, but for this particular thing, I'm not going to go on that soapbox thing because I can so stay there. But let's go to the breaking, okay, so I'm doing breaking the revolving door. So what I want to share with you, I'm going to go ahead and share with you about myself. And I will tell you that, uh, who, is it, who, who is Andrea Garcia? Is she here? He's coming. He's it's a man? Yes. Thank God he's not here when I just called him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> Score, <laughs> save. So, that's good. So, what, that, it's very interesting because this has come full circle. And I'll tell you how. Um, so, I have been in prison five times. I have five felonies. And I have probably been in Harris County Jail that's what, about 26 times, I think. And this all started, uh, I'm 45 now, uh, it started when I was 19. Um, going, and, and it started very minimal, you know, the, the things, just the minimal things. We don't know that it's a progression of stuff. Um, so going back, so, you know, getting, starting at 19, going in and out, and then, I was homeless for 12 years on Telephone Road um, and prostitution and doing drugs. So I have those felonies. Those are what the felonies that I have. Now the other stuff is, to be honest with you, I don't even know. Um, you know, I looked at my record one day. I pulled it up. I don't know how. Uh, it's just resourceful. I learned that on the street. I found it. And uh, I'm like, really? I did that? I don't remember that. And I didn't do that that many times. And uh, so it was just very <laughs> interesting to uh, see that, and, and I'm gonna tell you in that, um, it didn't have to be that. It could have been stopped so many years ago. And it probably could have been stopped in 1996, in September, and I got this, I don't know how I'm getting to this. So obviously it was a very interesting and something very important, but in September 1996, I think it was the fourth, I had gotten my first possession charge. My whole life changed. I mean, besides the, all the ins and outs of the county jail, it's like, why didn't they just see it then? And then it had to get to this place where I was going to prison. And I had never, ever been in trouble in my life. And, um, and I really didn't know what was going on in there. I was just totally caught up. But at the time, so y'all know in the county jails, there's not, there is nothing. Really, there's nothing. They do their best with what they have and the money that they have. And it's just really lack of source resources, I believe, and lack of not knowing really what to do. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It, it, that's, um, there's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, we're just trying to figure it out as we go along. So here we are. And so being locked up, you know, and then not knowing my thing was is I couldn't stop thinking, I couldn't stop moving, I couldn't really hunker down to uh, focus on anything. And probably a lot of the trauma that I had experienced in my lifetime, uh, being raped and being molested and a lot of, you know, very harmful things that had happened had um, led up to here I am in jail. Here I am with people and it's really crazy in jail. I want you to know when you're already not well and you can't stop what's going on in your head, but you want to, and you're just screaming in silence, it is hell. 
and in a in a jail system when you go in there and everybody else is screaming and everybody else is just just dysfunctional and I'm going to say that on both parts not only on the inmates part but also in with some of the officers not because they mean to be but because it's so overwhelming for everybody because you've got people screaming at you and then you've got people screaming at you and um, so there was no healing in that for the first what, am, what I'm 45 I don't know so, so let's just say for the first what me going in and out 12 years this was the most unhealing and unhealthy place but in that I'm going to tell you something that going there often I prayed to be there and I I literally would pray please you know God give let me go back to jail because at least even in the chaos there was this structure now it may be it was unhealthy and being that what I'm gonna said that it could have stopped way back when is um, maybe and we can change that now so it doesn't you know we don't have to look at it could have stopped really we can change that now and say you know what today we can have people in there that have been there we can have people in there that have made the difference in their lives and that's huge no matter what it looks like just to know that it doesn't have to meet to your expectations of what you think that it should be um, so if we can have someone in there and if I would have had someone to say okay wait I don't want to minimize the people in there okay there's people in there that do have some mental illness there's people in there that truly they don't and this is the real out reality is people have committed crimes and they're in jail now I probably the things that I committed they weren't things that I probably should have been in jail for um, I needed to be out of society yes and I needed help and I needed structure but did that mean I had to go and get stuff on my record that would ruin my life that I had to work so hard for that made life even harder to get to where I'm at I don't believe so I really don't are there things that yes we need to do that yes there are but we need to look at situations individually even though it's a large system we forget that those are people not numbers not it we're not that I think that's a big huge um, part of the revolving thing is it's and it's so I'm trying to make sense out of this because I want to honor all both places where people are in in jail and um, they've done some really bad things and I'm not anti-jail and jail did save my life um, it also prolonged this this journey and um, I probably could have been doing a lot better so I've been with my kids a lot earlier just if I'd have had somebody to say hey let's go to this unit I mean I'm cool with hey I did this and I need to be there because that's what society says to an extent I'm cool with it and but let me get help while I'm in here so I'm not coming back because I probably cost y'all so much more than I do now and now I get back and pay taxes and um, so being going into jail and why it's so important maybe in the beginning first of all the process of uh, booking is so traumatizing so degrading that that just added to the trauma that I was already having um, because it's not fun to get in there and to get naked in the hallway with a bunch of people and bend over your duties to and this really does happen that's traumatizing so maybe in the beginning the very first question besides get against the wall do this what do you have you know what stuff like that treating you so you may maybe just say hey are you diagnosed with a mental illness or maybe having the officers trained to recognize it even would be great because they could even stop and begin the process right from the start if I think that if I would have had that I probably wouldn't have spent the next 15 years of my life on the streets in and out of prison and then uh, I mean the jails in prison and not because that I needed you to do it for me I just needed someone to care enough to say hold on let's look at this differently I just needed someone to be more human with me than I was with myself period I needed someone and isn't that what we're supposed to do really when you really look at it when we, when does someone not need somebody 
it's not, it's not, I mean, really, you know, we're human, that's all. And it's, so going in, um, so my mental health led to my, so I'm, I'll tell you my diagnosis, even though that's not who I am. I'm diagnosed with bipolar, OC, anxiety, major depression, and some, sometimes I get religiously preoccupied. <laughs> very, very heavily. <laughs> um, so those are the things that are uh, the symptoms and, and that the particip particular uh, elements, elements of me. They're not bad. They're not, you know, they're beautiful. They've made me so much stronger than who I used to be. Um, in a positive way. I mean, it took strength to be in and out of prison and, and to be on the streets and to get raped and to do all, all this stuff that happened. But this is a totally different strength. It's a strength to share and love now. Um, so the mental health, you know, not being diagnosed, and I'll tell you, I will tell you, I did not get diagnosed till 2004, and I have not been in prison, and I have not got locked up and done anything since 2004. And so that's great, because I was spending every year locked up. Every other year, I'd come out, and uh, literally, that's the revolving door. Every, I'd get out, be out a year, go right back in another year. And I, this went on for 12 years, solid. Uh, and I would go right straight back to the street, straight back to being homeless, straight back to going to get raped and beat again. Every year, for 12 years. And what's sad is I thought that's what I deserved. That what, that's what, that was my only hope. And because there was no healing, you know, being locked up, there was just more hurt and more, just a lot of hurt and, you know, and no fault of anybody, just of us not knowing. So now we know, and so now we need to make the difference. And we, we could have people in there saying, you know, um, what's particular to you? What's really going on? What happened to you? Where is your hurt from? What's not? Let's look at what the crime and why did you do this and all this. But uh, maybe saying what's going on. Maybe having people more aware of behaviors. Um, and I don't like that word either, but that's something that the forefront the officers, when they're working with people, and because many people, the officers are really saving our lives. But um, I think that we can go above and beyond that, because there's going to be jails anyway. It's not like Texas going to through their prison system. But we could make it different where we don't go back and we help people that that are truly honestly just trying to be better but just don't know how um so what made the difference and stop that revolving door and literally it took from 1996 to 2004 so that's kind of ridiculous don't you think as a society how is that a responsible society i don't think it is not not for that many years and then in 2004 to have tacomi which is a, pro, uh, a program of mhmr Someone finally came in there and said, you know what, uh, I know her name too, Kim, I'll never forget it. That was my saving grace. Um, so Kim came in there and all they had to do, and I was in uh, Plain State Jail <coughs> in Dayton. That was my fifth time in that one uh, because I did not have any more opportunities for jail. Does that make sense? <laughs> my opportunities to stay in Karis County Jail were done. It was now... I'm on my fifth felony, so I keep going back to this. And then I, I don't know how I did not get 25 years for my last felony. I really don't. Um, but that's what was my saving grace. So here comes Tacomi. Kim from MHMR. Never, mind you, in the history of my incarcerations, and I knew my cops, uh, uh, Officer Stevenson, yeah, I knew him really well. He would call my name on the loud thing when he was driving down Telephone Road. Okay, I knew my officers, and they knew me. They didn't even let me pay my rent at the hotel before they took me to jail. So why couldn't they really know me and see that something? I wasn't out there. I didn't rip people off. I wasn't that kind of hope. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't doing that. I was so harming myself, you know? And, and I was like the honest one. <laughs> if that could be, I don't know how you do that. But I, I was the honest one. Pay my bills. I actually ate. I just was not well. And uh, so, Mr. Stevenson, where are you? Why couldn't you have seen, right? 
or this one uh, detective rooster i'll never forget this guy just you know these things it's like um why didn't they make the difference it didn't it didn't but then they came in and i'm going to tell you why it made the difference i'm going to tell you what made them come in uh tdc had plain state jail had di given me medication without really their diagnosing but they just started giving me medication right they did this stupid test, like 300 question test, that was so ridiculous and didn't really, it was just ridiculous. And they put me on lithium. Well, I got toxic, I passed out, I couldn't get out of bed, and I got cases for that in seg. Wouldn't that have been enough to make a difference? It didn't. Not for them. Somehow, MHMR came. I think I had someone that actually cared, maybe that advocated for me somewhere. <coughs> or by the grace of God, I don't know. But they came in my toxicity, in my sickness, and my healing began. Because all she said is, when you get out, here is an appointment, I care and we can do this. I did, we did, there was no thing says peers there at this time in 2004, there was none of that. It was a caseworker that chose to go the extra and it's not even a mile, y'all. It's just a step. Y'all, it's, it's a step. Came in, uh, because someone actually said, I care. Because someone actually said, you're not bad. Let's just see what's going on. And because someone said, hold yourself to accountability. Which I should have. You, and I did. And because someone made an appointment for me and gave me resources, they didn't find a place for me to live. I went to Beaumont and I left. No, I've never been to Beaumont in my life at this time. <clears throat> I, never, I didn't know anybody there. I had no home. I had no clothes and I had no money. But they gave me some people to write. Uh, and I wrote them. All because I would never have done this. I would have been back on telephone row probably been dead. To be honest with you, right now, <clears throat> I'd have been done a long time ago. <laughs> and if this person would not have come in and just offered me help, I could have done. I mean, I got myself in jail. I was. It's not that I'm stupid and not resourceful. No, I got hustle. That that wasn't that. It's just I used it something different now, and I used it to. Well, shit. The lady cared. She came and she gave me, and she said, "Just do this." And all I had to do was write somebody, and somebody I don't even know came and picked me up in Dayton. I had nothing, and I don't know what they, I don't know why they give you blue Smurf suits, but I had this <laughs> stupid suit on, which is degrading in itself. Imagine going through with that already and then getting out, and you're wearing a stupid paper suit that makes you look like you escaped from a mental institution. And I can say that because I have. I escaped from Harris County Psychiatry Center twice. <laughs> uh, so imagine the degradation in that just in itself and still holding on to this little bit of hope, this little bit of faith that this person came in there and gave me. That was the beginning of my healing. I haven't been back. It has been a hell of a ride and a long journey. And one of the most beautiful yet painful ones I've ever had, if that makes any sense. This is hard. But thanks to peer support. Thanks for Takomi coming in. Thanks for, actually, Officer Stevenson for not, he did treat me with some dignity just by letting me pay my rent. So I, as I think about it, and I love when I have these moments, there was someone, that officer, that actually did treat me with some kind I mean, I was going to jail because I was doing wrong, you know? You can't just be out there doing that. Uh, but he let me pay my rent. He called me by my name. That in itself is huge. And that made the difference. We don't have to have a revolving door. There is a place for jail, and there, yes, there is. There's people that do need to be in jail. And there's people that, you know what, don't really need to be there. And I think that it's what the beginning of the 
start is really actually in this room in this discussion. And in that, I say that uh, thanks be to God, because that's, thanks be to God, that we can now have this discussion and that we can look at something and look at it in a different way. And that we can come together because it's not one person that's going to do it. It takes a huge village and we need to come together and bring all of our own passions and our own whatever that is. We need everybody to be part of the team. And I think that by being in the room and we've started it now, thank you, Linda. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're going to be the catalyst for the change. We are. And it, it's all of us doing our own special, unique part. And um, on that, I want to go back in prison and help people. <laughs> and I want to go back into jails. I want to go to Harris County Jail, where I spent in revolving doors. And I spent so much of my, God, the best of my, the best me was taken. Damn. You think? No So, God, I sure was hot then. I was skinny. That's all right, though. Uh, we can just, we can make the difference. And we are now. It, start, it started here. This is where we are. And so what, a, what an amazing way, huh, to live life is to make that difference and to honor everything. And on that, I'm done. <laughs> You can see why we wanted to start the morning with Tuesday. Tuesday, you have such a um, powerful way of communicating your experience, and we have so much to learn from that. So thank you for, thank you. for starting us off. Um, Tuesday's agreed to, to take questions and comments from people, um, so uh, we'll open up the floor. Remember, we are live streaming, so if you're in the back, project, and, and we'll try to, to repeat questions if they seem soft-spoken. Yeah. Well, first, just thank you, Tuesday. And I want to reiterate to you how much I admire you and love you for your courage. Thank you. Yeah. And just to emphasize the need for trauma-informed <laughs> systems throughout Texas, because I think that would have picked up on what you were dealing with. Totally. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that we, have, we, we can no longer, now that we know, shame on us for not doing something about it. There was a time when we didn't, right? Right, right. And that's but now fair. we know, and if we start really taking on trauma, having trauma-informed systems and treating trauma, we might find out that a lot of what people go through that we call mental illness can be dealt with in a whole different way. So just thank you for sharing your story so openly, and I love you. Love you, too. Anybody? <coughs> yes. You You did all the work, sweetheart. I love you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to thank you for sharing your story. Oftentimes, um, there's not an environment to do that in, in front of a room full of different professionals and police officers who can hear um, one person's journey throughout the system. And I'm a product of the system myself. Um, and I think that what you're doing is going to create change for others um, in the future. Because I've often thought, maybe if I had a peer whenever my first journey into jail, into the system, maybe it wouldn't have taken so long for me to Indeed. In that, you know what? And, and I honor you and totally love you. And I think for us just to be heard and validated through our voice and our experience to have the peer and the person there makes a huge difference in itself because we spent either tra trauma in childhood not being heard and our voices didn't matter. Um, just the simplest thing of maybe a peer in, in the um, booking, remember when we're sitting in there, because Harris County takes like what you're in there like 
18 hours in that cold little cell, right? There's some time for someone to come in and have talk to me instead of me sleeping in the middle of the floor with 100 people. I mean, it's cool that I'm doing it because that's where I'm at, but hey, what if someone would have come in there and just heard me? That one time, the one time, because you can't go nowhere, you're going to be there anyway, you got, like, attention. God, what a difference it would have made just for someone to come in there and say, are you hurting? What are you going through right now? Because that's a very painful, isn't it? Isn't it? When you've gone and you're going and you're so tired, right? And you're in the booking, you're, you're in that little room down there and you're just wanting to get the mat and go upstairs to the other little room that you're going to sit in for 13 hours. But imagine the difference if I would have had a peer to talk to me in that very first processing part to say, you know, this is a journey. I'm going to go on it with you. Wow. Thank you. That would have so made, and it probably would have made the jail better, <laughs> and it probably would have made a better experience for the people around me, and I would have been on my road to recovery. Tuesday, we've got a number of peer support specialists in the room, but we also have people who, who are new to peer support. Could you just say a few words about what you do when you're in your role as a peer support specialist? Um, it depends on what role I'm doing at the time, to be honest with you. So, um, as a, okay, in my role as forensics, when I did work in Austin State Hospital with Sarah, and she allowed, and that began my work, actually, with, I worked in the forensics, and, uh, which was really great. Um, what I did there is, uh, there, they were in the hospital for not competent to stand trial, for whatever, whatever the reason, they're in the forensics unit, and they're not getting out, and I get to work with them. And so my role then was, I would go in and just find out what, actually, my beginning conversation was, dude, what's up? <laughs> and how can I help you? And then all I would start, and mine did not start by asking them what their goals were. And not something huge. Just something, what, what are your goals and what do you make you happy? That's all I wanted to know. And then the, the journey began from there. And it took that because, you know, I actually asked them, what they what they wanted in life. It wasn't about me putting on anything except for saying, hey, what do you want out of life? What are your goals? Even in the midst of the storm, being in this locked up place, who are you? Not what are you, what happened, none of that, or even what happened to you, because I don't like asking that, to be honest with you. It's, uh, I, I don't like it. I'm like, who are you? And what do you want to do? What do, you, what do I need? to do for you? How can I help you in this journey to the next step, whatever that looks like? Not my step, mind you. In, that, in a peer support role, it's <laughs> not about what my step or my journey, so much that that's going to be yours. But we say, hey, Joe, what is it that you would like for your life? And, and Whatever that looks like, you know, working at a library, going back to college, working at McDonald's, it doesn't matter because it's about what they want for their life and how do we best support the person. And then we share as um, time goes on and you build a relationship, you'll find times when you then share your lived experience. And you, you share it only in relationship to them opening the door for it to be shared. You know what I mean? That's when the magic happens. Yes? Well, I want to reiterate that you're an amazing, amazing advocate, and you touch my heart at this point here, And I know you personally, so I know the, the honesty of who you are. And I, I was going to ask if you could speak a little bit to, A, what it does for a family, your family, when, when you're in that, and then B, how much is it that when you wind up in a system like that, that you feel that this is who you are now? You know, I am the jailbird, I am the, the criminal, I am what that. And how much of it is having to have people realize that just because you've had this experiment, experience, that isn't who you are? You know, okay, so I'm going to go on. Um, my family, uh, so being in, in and out of Harris County Jail 26 times and then I obviously lost my kid uh, to CPS. Um, 
I got help and I worked my way through that. I got them back and I got my son to college. Okay? Now, that was a long time. And I need you to repeat one thing at a time. So, <laughs> my family. So, the family, it tore it up and my children were hurt in the process. However, they would have been more hurt if they would have been with me. Not physically, do you understand? Um, everything worked according how it should have been with what we had in place at the time. But now that we know, it can be different. It would have been different if we would have worked together as a family and I didn't get isolated from my children. They paid the price for something I did and for who I was, and that's not right. I don't care how you look at it. Don't tell me that it is. Even the simplest act of a letter or having someone be a liaison would have made a difference. Period. Okay, what was the next one? Yeah, and that was exactly the point is that the family, when we, when we don't help people and, and treat people when, at that time, it not only affects that person, it, 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 it blooms. But the second one was, how difficult is it, or what does it take to have people realize, even though you've had this experience, that's not who you are. That doesn't have to define who you are for the rest of your life. Okay, so the biggest step, I, I think, is not, the biggest step was me not defining me that way. Right. Um, forget. And how did you get to that? <laughs> I'm still getting there. I still <laughs> wake up in the morning thinking I'm, I'm just a piece of shit. Yeah. Okay, I still wake up crying. Uh, I do. I go to bed thinking that. Um, the only difference is, Thinking and knowing are two different things. Um, in other words, uh, knowing and accepting that I had a mental illness was a totally different experience. So I guess uh, thinking and accepting are two different things. So I may wake up with that even years into knowing all that I know. Does that take away those voices telling me you are that prostitute, you are that drug user, you are that inmate, you are that whatever I'm not going to say that it does but what I have now because of support and people like y'all that um, say you are a human and you are worth something and come and help people that's the truth that I have to go and remind myself of every sometimes every minute sometimes every day sometimes I get breaks and I have a month you know that's those are the trend the things that go on did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, yeah, I, just, I think it points to that that is one of the hardest things to get past. I mean, we can treat people, we can get them out, and even get them sober. Or get them oh, well, talking like we're doing right now is what changes the perception. Exactly. Okay, so us in this room, I mean, it may not change everything right now, but you know what, you're going to go out to the community. I'm going to try to. You're going to go to the community, right? And, and things are going to change. You just don't hear things and not change. I don't think things are void when you give them out to the universe or anything. Somewhere it's going to get passed on. So what, what changes is a perception is speaking, is being here. And then you going out and be the change. Even persons with not mental illness or no history of, of this stuff, you can still be the change for me of how you, people see me. That's where the change happens. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, so Tuesday. We know you're incredible. I think people who are just meeting you this morning are getting a glimpse of that. We hope that you realize you. that soon. Thank you. I know you all have more questions and comments. Tuesdays agreed to be on the panel at the end of the day, so, so write them down, save them. We'll have all of our speakers back up on the, on the final panel and a chance to, to tie this all together. But thank you so much, uh, you. Tuesday, for, for opening it.